the question for the start that, of the well, interview. We'll yes, it is fine. About that, but but the, but that's the, the question that's for the start the of the interview I is, have, I just want to I just want to make sure here that we're kind of going by rules of the road. The question is, yeah, and you'll get gotta, time to talk. You got to say that. And, and what I'm saying is that that I don't have to say anything, sir. I'm it, asking you it, the question is, do you realize you are describing a coup? No, uh, I, I totally reject many of your premises there. Uh, Ari, uh, look, you're doing your prosecutor thing. How about you give me a chance to talk now? Is that okay? Uh, it would follow from your contention that you think Vice President Harris will ultimately have the call over who should be president, regardless of the results in the next election? See, you, you misconstrued the whole Green Bay Sweep plan. But it seems like it's making you stretch when we just change the name from Pence to Harris. Are you no, 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 holding no, no. the contention? No. If you say all those things out here, why risk a legal battle or going to jail to refuse to discuss them with the committee under oath? Uh, because uh, I have a loyalty to the Constitution and a loyalty to the president. It's not my privilege to waive. So he claimed, and Navarro did take the questions as mentioned. He also defied the lawful subpoena. He also claimed that he thought he was entitled to privilege, as I was discussing with the guests. But there was a clear shredding of aspects of the privilege claim by discussing all this in public. And then the January 6th committee used some of these interviews you just saw as evidence for the case for contempt. At the same time he was refusing to comply with our subpoena, Mr. Navarro made multiple media appearances during which he discussed his various roles in the events that culminated in the January 6th attack. I'd like to play a video, uh, media clip right now. I have so much knowledge uh, to share with you about what, what I was involved in and what I know. He has so much knowledge to share with a journalist, but he refuses to share that knowledge in response to a lawful subpoena. That's how the committee put it in their evidence and vote for him in contempt, Ellie. And here we are, 6, 10 p.m. on the East Coast in Washington tonight, and now the actual culmination of all this is a vote to hold him in contempt. Uh, what is your view of what it means to get Mr. Navarro on the record, to have some of these individuals uh, who are clearly willing to discuss what they think they could get away with, um, while still defying the lawful process to say the same remarks or the same explanation uh, to the Congress that actually has the power to investigate this? Yeah, all Navarro is doing is denying that Congress has a right to investigate this process, th this issue, right? Because he's willing to come on your show and talk about it. So he's willing to violate whatever privilege he thinks he has. He's willing to break it to come talk to you. He's willing to break it when the cameras are on. He's just not willing to break it for Democrats in Congress because he has some ridiculous view that Democrats in Congress are not legitimate. So, like, one of the things that I don't understand with some of these Republicans, Navarro being a great example of it, but Bannon, too, to some extent, and certainly all the Republicans who are going to vote against the contempt proceeding tonight, what do they think is going to happen when, when the shoe's on the other foot? Like, in what universe does any Democrat ever again submit to any congressional oversight over anything, ever. Like, why would that ever right. happen again? Like, what well, are you're speaking, against, what's the end game here, right? Right, and you're, well, you're speaking to the, that's something we heard so much about in the last uh, five years, norm busting and the cost of that. Uh, Michael, I put the same question to you. Uh, at a time when people are skeptical, we showed the, the, the graph that, uh, the graphic that Mr. Bannon was indicted, uh, but other people who've been held in contempt have not been indicted yet. What do you see as important tonight in this vote that we're tracking right now uh, for contempt for two Trump aides? Accountability, accountability, accountability. I cannot emphasize enough how valuable and important that is to the people in this country who give a damn about the honesty and the truth about what happened, finding out who's culpable. The country is not looking at this through a partisan lens as much as Republicans would like them would like to believe that therefore going to go out and showboat the way they have on this issue. The reality of it is, it goes exactly what Ellie's saying that you have people out here pretending there's a privilege when there is no privilege. So even if you had the privilege, guess what? It ended on January 20th. <laughs> 
when the new president was inaugurated. So if you, even if you had it up to the 19th, even up to 11.59, you didn't at 12 o'clock or 12.01. So these claims are false and phony. The American people know it, which is why I go back to the first point. The emphasis at this point is, is twofold. One, what is the committee doing that brings out and holds accountable those individuals? And two, once held accountable by the committee, what is our criminal justice system, our Justice Department, going hmm. to do about that? Well, you bring me to the next point, Michael, and that might be because you and Ellie are sharp thinkers that uh, take us forward. And again, I'll tell viewers. We're watching the vote. You can see most members of Congress have not voted yet, but this is the open vote uh, to hold two Trump aides in contempt. Uh, what's next, as Michael asks, Ellie? Well, here's reporting from NBC that the FBI actually has now gathered hundreds more suspects, would be the legal term, uh, but doesn't have enough lawyers when it looks at who was there on the 6th. More than 500 active cases that need to be resolved, and that includes tapping online sleuths who identified to the FBI hundreds of additional January 6 rioters. And, Ellie, trespassers and rioters is sort of the minimum, uh, if there's video of them, because that's like smoking gun evidence of that. Whether once you get into the case and you put some heat on, as we all learned, some of them may have, quote, unquote, Trespass is the only thing they did, fine. Others, if you put the heat on 500 cases, you and I know, Ellie, statistically, you're going to find people who had a weapon. You're going to find people who had email traffic. You're going to find people who uh, were thinking that they could steal the certification. So they're in on the civic citizen coup uh, efforts. Uh, what does it tell you and how do you feel, Ellie? And this is a question I, I may know where you're, where you're going to end up, but I'll let you say it. How do you feel that over a year later, uh, this FBI and this DOJ are struggling to get the resources for cases that are half done by the internet yeah started at the bottom and we still here we're still at the bottom we're still at the <laughs> intake point all of these people should have been arrested on january 6th there's no reason for chris ray the director of the fbi to let these people walk out the capitol they should have been walked out the capitol into a paddy wagon taken directly to jail do not pass go do not collect 200 dollars, and that should have happened 15 months ago so, yeah, I am, I am distressed that we are still um, lacking the resources to prosecute all these people. But I do have an idea, Ari, because the other night I heard Tom Cotton praise former Justice Robert Jackson for going to Nuremberg and prosecuting Nazis in the Nuremberg trial. Maybe Tom, uh, maybe Tom Cotton, who has a Harvard Law degree, should volunteer to go down to the DOJ and prosecute the insurrectionists, like his <laughs> hero, Robert Jackson. Do you think that that could work? I mean, they, they clearly need the help, and it's not like Tom Cotton is doing a whole lot right now. I, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, there, you put it out there. People can hear you. Like Peter Navarro, uh, Peter can hear you when you, uh, people can hear you when you speak on television, Ellie. So th that idea will go out around Washington. Michael, uh, Ellie has the vim and vigor of someone who cares deeply, uh, doesn't take himself too seriously, but— but has the concern that I know you and so many others do, Michael, which is if people can publicly stage this kind of trespass, insurrection, violence, chanting, hang Mike Pence, and there's video of them and they're not picked up, right. what message does that tell them for next time? What is the risk right. of Merrick Garland here uh, basically doing? And again, these are the numbers. I'm not offering an opinion. Everyone's got opinions. That's not really the best use of my time. I'm offering reporting, Michael. Uh, it's a half-done project by their own numbers of open cases uncharged or unresolved. Some of them might not be charged, but they'd be uh, right. declamated. But either way, it's not done because they're not getting it done. Well, here's the vinegar to my friend's uh, uh, sort of vim and, and uh, inspired thinking. The vinegar is this sucks. This just sucks all around. We watch this. We watch people create, uh, uh, engage in criminal activity. And those um, in certain communities around this country know that when stuff goes down, you don't get to go home, right? So all of a sudden, yep. you, you got people getting back on their buses that were chartered for them by a political party to get them here to storm the Capitol. Um, they get to go home, and here we are, as Ellie says, 15 months later, and our Justice Department is saying, well, uh, we're just finding out we don't have enough people to prosecute. We do, we're finding more people who committed wrongdoing. 
Well, if you had your television on on January 6th, <laughs> you knew what those numbers were. You knew what this was going to be like. I don't think there has been a very serious ramping up here to understand exactly what this moment meant for the country, because it's all been clouded by the politics. No one yeah. wants to threaten the structure of things because, oh, my God, it involves a former president or it involves the former chief of staff or, oh, Lordy B, Jesus, what are we going to do because it's part of the, of, the, of the political family of Donald Trump? Throw all those people up and get them in front of a, 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 you know, a lineup and do what the criminal justice system requires you to do. You're not going to think about it when there's a riot over in Watts or over here in Southeast D.C. Nobody's going to say, okay, y'all go home. We'll call you back later. That's not how it works. And we watch that. And so the part that sucks for so many Americans is how frustrating it is to hear people parse and pretend and, and allocute to craziness and just and act like we're not watching them do that. So, yeah, um, the, the vinegar is January 6th will die this November, on the first Tuesday in November, when the country decides to give power back to the party that caused the damn insurrection. And what do you think they're going to do with it? Think about that over the next six months, folks, and decide what kind of country you want and what direction you want the criminal justice system to go in. Because the other answer to Ari's question is, don't come knocking on me with warrants and, and, and subpoenas, because I have now learned from the whitest of the best and the best of the whitest to know it don't apply to me no more. Because they can get away with it, so can I. And if you want to open up that Pandora's box in this country, have at it and just reap what sows from it.